Well, welcome everyone. I think we're ready to get started. Uh, my name is Paul Nizwicki. I am the CEO of the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome everyone to the Chamber's first Advocacy in Action Forum. Uh, we uh, start out with a supremely important issue in uh, child care and early education. Uh, so I thank you all for showing up in person tonight and those of you who are in direct. Hi, Kai. <laughs> I'm so glad you could, you could join us. Uh, so we will we'll kick it off. We have uh, an esteemed panel uh, with us tonight. We have two uh, people that are going to present talk online. Uh, Tom Weber, uh, is the executive director of the Math Business Coalition for Early Childhood Education and has been doing a lot of work on the state level. And joining us online will be Amy O'Leary, the Executive Director of Strategies for Children. And uh, we have our Steve panel up there. I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves. So, sorry from the left. Hi, I'm, I'm Patty Moore. I'm Superintendent of the Dutch Public Schools. My name is Gail Greer, and I am the Chair of the Orleans School Committee and former Assistant Superintendent of Monson. Jackie Beebe, I'm the town administrator for the town of East Cape. I'm Christy Sanatori, I'm the executive director of the Cape Cod Commission. Hi, and I'm Sandy Fagan Silva. I'm coordinator of the Cape and Islands chapter of the Common Start campaign. Common Start Coach. Thank you all and so much found. For, for joining us this evening. Uh, so we're going to go through this, but the, the sense of what we're trying to do with the advocacy in action sort of program is to really sort of frame these issues of child care and early education. There's a lot of things happening on the federal level, on the state level, on a regional level. And then on the Cape, we've got uh, municipalities that are actively engaged in this issue. And I don't think a lot of people know that, that don't live in those towns. So uh, our, our approach and what we hope the outcome will be tonight is to sort of frame this issue. Uh, for everyone, so then you can see where all these pieces fit in. And there's obviously a lot of ARPA money that's uh, out there, and also a couple of major pieces of legislation, one moving on federal level, and at least one moving on state level, that could have major impacts in a positive way. Um, so we are gonna get started. I have a couple of slides, just to put this issue in context, and it, it has been an issue for a long time, uh, but COVID-19 has brought, has sort of um, exposed uh, some of the weaknesses in the system and some of the things that we need to get better. The good news is that there's money out there now to maybe try some things that we haven't been, that have been financially prioritized uh, in the past. So, this is Katie Atchison. Uh, I've got three machines on, so <laughs> uh, bear with so, me. <laughs> so if, you, if you look at the COVID-19 impact on women in the workplace to begin with, it's really just been, it's been devastating. I mean, there's no other word to really sort of use that. The, uh, the slide that's up, up here now looks at attitudes towards work, jobless women, uh, their search for work, and then the fact that they're searching uh, less than men. So you look at jobless prime age and men that are actively uh, searching the most, and you can see that uh, so yellowish orange line, solid line, the jobless women, the greenish, tealish line of jobless men. And the dotted line is employed men. The dotted yellow line are employed women. And you can see how that tracks from July uh, 2021 uh, to February 2022. So you can see that there's a marked difference there. Next slide. I'm oh, sorry. So early education. I uh, skipped one by accident. We were at a, a NACE conference, the Massachusetts Association Chambers of, of Chamber of Commerce yeah, Executives, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and Michael Goodman from UMass uh, uh, gave a presentation. This slide came up and it really took everybody uh, in the room. It was really kind of a shocking slide. So, this one right here. That's not the slide. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> slide three. <laughs> so we'll get there. This is the main question, right? Uh, they surveyed. Uh, men and women and ask them what the reasons were that they did, weren't going back to work, right? Because the biggest issue that we're facing on the Cape from an economic perspective right now is labor supply. Uh, we have a lot of employees that just can't find people to work. Uh, and I think when the federal benefits expired last September, people expected that everyone was going to show up. 
that didn't happen at all. Uh, so there's gonna, there, there are more sort of systemic underlying issues at, at work here. So this isn't the slide either. What was the other slide? <laughs> Is this one? Okay, yeah, this one. That was the one. Okay. Yes. They're the same slide. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. So that was the confusion. <laughs> so when we look at uh, the interview, you ask them, why, why aren't you going back to work? I'm not going back because my spouse is employed. I'm not going back because I can't find um, decent, affordable childcare. I'm not going back because I have COVID concerns. I'm not going back because I have a financial cushion. I don't need to go back. I'm not going back uh, because the unemployment benefits uh, are, are still pretty good. And uh, I'm not going back because I've only been temporarily laid off. I'm waiting for a phone call to, to come in. But if you look at the uh, male responses in that greenish color and the female responses in the gold and yellow colors, you see those first two categories. I'm not going back because my spouse is employed in childcare just jump off the map, the, the disparity between the male and the female responses there. Now, my guess is that those are actually related. You know, that would be my hypothesis. Uh, so childcare really is at, at, the, at the essence there. On the Cape, I think in general, but especially on the Cape, it's pronounced, we also have a housing issue, it's also related. So the labor response, housing, childcare. But those, those two uh, graphs make it. So I think the next slide is the close-up. Uh, <clears throat> so men are more likely to be uh, searching why. So you can see here that the percentage of job seekers between the ages of 25 and 54 describe this, who describe this search as urgent, right? This is the, the, the difference. And you can see uh, unemployed men seem to, to, to feel more of a sense of urgency than females go back. Okay, excellent. So this is your last one. This is the last one. Mm -hmm. So uh, that should set the context of COVID-19, some of the attitudes about going back to work, the importance of child care and early education in that concept. And so I want to thank our presenters, all of whom we've introduced. As I said, Amy O'Leary, uh, the executive director of Strategies of Children is online. And so she's, she's going to be first up in our presentations, then Tom Lever. And then our board up here, which we have introduced to you, uh, Sandy, Jackie, Gail, uh, Trisha, and Christy. Uh, they'll all speak individually. So just a few sort of housekeeping issues we have. We're here and scheduled until eight. We have a lot of speakers, but they all have a lot of interesting individual things to say. So we're gonna pause after every speaker and take questions that way. So we can start with our first speaker. Um, Amy O'Leary, Executive Director of Strategies for Children. So Amy should uh, magically appear on screen. I'm working <laughs> on it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I also have slides, which will probably complicate things. No, we, we also have slides. We'll, we'll figure it out. Oh, wow. My head is awfully big. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just don't look at yourself, Amy. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity for having us here tonight and for organizing it. Um, as we get started, I will make sure I have the slides available for folks to have, you know, we can send in a follow-up email. Uh, we have, there's hyperlinks in the slides. So can you see my slides? We're getting there. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> I can give you a little story about me. So I started off as a preschool teacher in the south end of Boston at a place called Ellis Early Learning. And I was there for almost 10 years as a preschool teacher and then director. And I joined Strategies for Children. Um, and at the time it was founder Margaret Blood who was leading the organization. And I started there as the early childhood field associate and have been there almost 20 years working as an advocate. And Strategies is a statewide organization that has uh, working to ensure that Massachusetts invests the resources needed for children birth through five. And I will, little spoiler alert, Tom Weber also worked at Strategies for Children as part of his career. And so it's so fun to be with him tonight. 
Um, Amy, I don't think I have slides from you. I have Christy's slides and I have Sandy's slides. I was worried about that. It was a big, I can just, I can, um, you can, I can share. Use this slide. Yeah. I can share. Yeah. I'm okay. going to make you great. There you go. You should be able to share your screen. Perfect. Thank you so much. It was, it was a big file and my emails are also going to people's spam, which is making my professional life <laughs> very exciting as I try to uh, make sure people are getting my emails. Great. So uh, uh, strategies for children, you can see this is just a little bit about our work and the form that it takes. Um, I won't read all of these, but just so you can see the work that we've been doing. Uh, working coalition, a uh, lot of education, uh, elected officials, the media, general public. We are focused on elections as we think about the end of the year. And then really our work as advocates for bu uh, budget and legislative line items. And one of the things that happened during the pandemic is we started the 930 call, which has been a call that it was happening five days a week at 930 in the morning from 930 to 10. We have since moved uh, to four days a week, but we used it during the pandemic as a chance to get together. There was so much fear and anxiety and worry and policies were changing. And so we used it uh, as an opportunity to build community across the state, have a central place, kind of like a campaign. We just checked in every day to see how things were going. Um, we, and then, and we, anybody is welcome to sign up. I can include that in the follow-up email. We have guests, uh, we also have updates from the field, so it's a good opportunity to learn about kind of what the vibe is. And then you can see we have our blog. These are our, our net advocacy network um, and the Massachusetts Inv Partnership for Infants and Toddlers. And as you think about the vibe, uh, right now is really how much more can we take is what we're hearing from folks. We have heard incredible stories from leaders who have shown up every day for children. And we continue to be inspired by this workforce, this resilient problem-solving workforce. We know that press coverage is at an all-time high and that advocates have long called for early education and care to be a public good. And we really believe that now is our chance. As Paul mentioned, there's, there's been funding available at levels that we've never seen before. And we have a, you know, a whole new um, appreciation for what's happening in early education and care programs across the country. As we think about the time, we've seen that many things have come into light, especially around this mixed provider system. We have family child care, for-profit, nonprofit centers, public schools. We've seen that flex flexible, stable funding has helped. We know we need better data. We know we have to trust providers. We've really seen what parent choice looks like. And if you think about the data that Paul shared, Programs across the state have seen that play out, whether families were deciding to send their child or not to early education and care programs or school age programs. And I'm sure Tom is going to talk about the connection to our economy. And one thing we want to really make clear is that we cannot one time fund our way out of decades of neglect. So when you hear the funding levels that are available, it can be tempting to think, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive, but we know that we're going to need additional dollars. And we've also seen the inequities be highlighted and then thinking about the day-to-day -day challenges that have to inform the policies. And we know that the staffing crisis is at an all-time high. Uh, we've seen it, uh, you know, it was a crisis before, but now it really is um, a huge challenge. And it's not just for early education and care. We know other sectors are struggling as well. And then when you think about advocacy, we really wanna think about who are the key decision makers, what do they need to know? And then how will we share information? We also want to think about knowing the process, uh, you know, and we'll talk about legislation, budget, and elections, who to contact about what. You know, there are so many organizations working together right now on, on these many issues from so many different stakeholder groups. Um, and not to be intimidated by the process. Sometimes as we're working with folks, especially in the field, sometimes it feels like the systems have been set up to not engage public input and engagement, but we know that we've seen incredible progress of early educators really learning about the legislative process and taking action. And so what we know right now in Massachusetts is we're in the middle of the story and you're gonna hear more about all of these topics 
And when you get the slides, these are all links to, that you can find out more information. But there can be so much to track. It can be very confusing to understand the difference between the supplemental budget, the state budget, the federal budget, and the state budget. So these are just some links to help you. The, the storyline is, so we are in the middle of many of these processes and we have opportunities to help influence them. Most important is to know who represents you. And I'm sure many of you know, but this is where you can find out where it is, especially after redistricting in mass, you know, after the census, states redistricted and so it's important to see if your legislate if your district is, has remained the same and what that means for the election this is the capital in washington dc and we know that we have two u.s senators u.s senator elizabeth warren and u.s senator ed markey and then we know that massachusetts has nine congressional districts for the house we know that we used to have 10, but after the 2010 census, we lost a U.S. rep seat. So we have stayed consistent at nine. And, um, you know, on most of the Cape and Islands is, is represented by Representative Keating. <clears throat> so when we think about the federal level, um, as I was preparing for this, I reached out to my folks that work on the national level, and we have heard so much about reconciliation but in 2021, it was the Build Back Better plan, and that has died. There was this talk around reconciliation, which is really the, a budget process in Washington, D.C., and one of my uh, Washington, D.C. contacts said, hope has not died, but it is being tortured. Um, but each, each day uh, that goes on, we are feeling, they said they were still feeling optimistic. It's hard to feel optimistic. Uh, at, at some point, there was $400 billion on the table for childcare and pre-K, and it was really changing the way we think about uh, childcare as an entitlement. And you can see the negotiations are continuing. We're also watching the House, excuse me, the appropriations process. Uh, the president has asked for increases in Head Start and childcare. We also have seen um, a, many different hearings and many different committees that are continuing to show this bipartisan support. Senator Warren testified at a hearing yesterday about, about inflation and the economy and connected it to child care. And then it just even more calls out the importance of our advocacy, both through our con Congress, uh, congressional delegation, and then for each of us as constituents. One opportunity is on May 9th, uh, advocates across the country are joining in for a day without child care, a solidarity strike and national day of action. And there's many ways to participate and it really is an opportunity to, for programs to work with families. So this is not about kind of making it hard for families. It's about raising awareness and working together with families. You can sign a pledge for this is why we can't close today. We saw our colleagues in Connecticut did this and they um, organized at, by local community. They got a ton of press just working with families to kind of close programs in the morning to show what the impact would be if we did not have childcare. And the, there's a link, it's a national movement on that day on May 9th. Um, and we are hoping to support providers who wanna participate. And then finally, we know that two, 2022 is an election year in uh, across the country. Our primary is set for September 20th. Our election day is November 8th. And you can see these are all of the offices that are up for election. So all of our constitutional officers, our full legislature, the House and the Senate, and then US representatives. And then why does this all matter? <laughs> and it's exciting to hear about um, kind of thinking about action. You can make a difference. We've seen people working together, changing policy and laws. And most importantly, policymakers need your expertise. If there's one lesson I've learned through the pandemic is how critical the voice of the people who are doing the work or feeling the pain is to be represented in the policymaking uh, discussions. So I'm going to leave it there and turn it over to Tom, who's going to share more details about um, the state level action. So Tom, I'll turn it to you. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, before I start, I just wanted to uh, thank Paul and thank Noel and thank the chamber for hosting us this evening and thank all of you for gathering with us this evening. And I wanted to just make sure as a point of, um, of order for these presentations, did you want to pause here? 
Holly Noel for Q&A with Amy, or did you want us to continue to proceed with, with our presentation? So I wanted to just confirm that. Thank you, Tom, and, and welcome. Are there, are there any questions for Amy, um, specifically on the, on the federal, on the presentation that she made? If there aren't, I think we can move forward with your presentation, Tom. My guess is that there'll be questions that come along that maybe Amy will chime in on. Thank you. Yeah, I, and I hope certainly that Amy does. Um, Amy and I uh, have a long history together and have done many, many a presentation like this together. And I'll happily answer any questions or share any questions with her as we're moving along. Um, and just one last point on that front. Uh, there, there is nobody really who embodies the sort of living history of early childhood advocacy in Massachusetts, like Amy O'Leary does. She's by far the most well-regarded advocate in the early childhood space that the state has seen over two decades. She has contributed uh, more than, than words could really ever, I think, give proper attribute to. So it's, it's just always a pleasure to be with Amy. She's a dear friend, uh, but somebody who's just extraordinarily steeped in all sorts of matters of early childhood education and extraordinarily respected. So it's great to follow your act, Amy. Um, thank you all for this opportunity. I'm Tom Weber. Uh, I have previously served as the state's commissioner of early education and care, overseeing the state system for more than six years before I joined Eastern Bank Foundation as a foundation fellow about two and a half years ago and worked with Eastern Bank Foundation and a number of business leaders to launch what is now known as the Massachusetts Business Coalition for Early Childhood Education, where I serve as executive director. And um, I'll share a few words on, on what that coalition is in just a moment, but I wanted to maybe reflect back on something that Paul said in his opening remarks, which is that these are not new issues that we're going to be discussing tonight. They're issues that have existed for decades, and while the pandemic economy certainly has exacerbated these issues, all of the challenges uh, that the early childhood education is presently facing were challenges that the system has been facing for a number of years. And I think a fundamental question that we have to put on the table is why has it taken us so long to address these, these concerns? And perhaps the answers are obvious, but I think that they're ones that we all benefit from being honest about. And it starts really with the facts that the, the politics of early childhood education um, are really stacked against children and parents with young children. Um, children don't have a vote. They don't have uh, money to influence the political system. And parents with young children are really passing through that phase of their parenting relatively quickly before their children advance on to K-12. And so there's really a vacuum uh, within this space that really demands advocacy on the part of anybody who cares about our children and our communities and about our economy, which will lead me to a conversation about the coalition in just a moment. But it's a vacuum that if not filled uh, is one that will continue, I think, to lead us to where we have previously arrived, which is with, to an insufficient result uh, for the children and families who rely upon this. And so that really was a big part of the calculus uh, that led to the idea of establishing a business coalition for early childhood education. And we are fortunate today to have 83 companies across the state. We've, we're a growing coalition. Uh, we launched with 70 a year ago and are at 83 now. But 83 companies uh, and 20 business associations, including the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce and a number of Cape employers who are part of this effort. Collectively, the member companies employ over 270,000 employees statewide. And the question you might ask is, is, why do folks want to be part of a business coalition for early childhood education? And again, some of these answers may seem overly simple, uh, but the reality is, is a coalition like this didn't exist until a year ago. And the employer community largely was not organized to the task of learning about early childhood education, the system's challenges, and how they might be able to play an active role in supporting these issues. And so that really is the reason why we stepped up, because we recognized as a business group that early childhood education, while having extraordinary benefits to children, uh, really is, uh, is urgently about the incumbent workforce challenges in Massachusetts and the incumbent economic challenges in Massachusetts. The labor market crisis in Massachusetts has been growing over years where we've had uh, negative growth in the population of working age adults in this state and nationally now for a number of years. 
And there is nothing that is uh, going to disrupt that trend line. Um, if we don't think about ways to capture and recapture inefficiencies within our domestic workforce. And I use that term inefficiencies in a way that probably seems impersonal, but truly it is uh, a function of an allowance by employers to allow parents with young children to exit the workforce. And as we have seen, that traditionally means mothers of young children to exit the workforce, either permanently or semi-permanently, uh, to great detriment to their own professional lives, to their family circumstances, and increasingly to the great detriment of employers across the country who simply cannot find skilled workers who they need in order to be able to be competitive uh, nationally and internationally within the economy. And so with that in mind, the 70 companies launched last year, as I said, we are growing and continue to grow and would welcome participation of more capable employers. We established a vision, which was that we were going to help Massachusetts create a world-class system of early childhood education. And we define that system as one that is serving children zero to five and their families with access and affordability and quality. It needs to be reliable for families uh, and sustainable for those early childhood education operators who are providing these services. And all that should be done regardless of race, income, or neighborhood. Uh, membership in our coalition is free. Uh, it is being supported by the Eastern Bank Foundation. We meet formally three times a year. Uh, we work together in between on our priorities. Uh, and those priorities are to be advocates uh, for an increased investment uh, on the public side in early childhood education, but also to be public-private partners, to think about where our corporate philanthropy and where our corporate subject matter might be able to help the state uh, solve some of the challenges uh, that have been daunting in the early childhood education space. And finally, to think about the role that employers could be thinking um, or more actively engaged in in supporting their own employees, that there's a real uh, space here for employers to be stepping up uh, and acting in their own right. So in those three areas of advocacy, public-private partnership, and employer best practice, we're trying to make our stake. And over the course of the last year, uh, we have you know, we found some success. We were part of the advocacy for new federal funds. Those federal funds uh, have really enabled the state uh, to deepen its investment, but those federal funds are one time in nature. And as Amy noted, uh, we really need to think about sustained commitment to early childhood education. We're not going to be able to do this as a one-off. It's going to take an ongoing commitment on all of our part. Uh, in addition to, uh, to those federal funds, we've also supported research. And you may have seen today, and if you haven't, in the Boston Globe, what was featured was a report by the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation, uh, which was uh, undertaken with financial support uh, and with active support from the Business Coalition. And that report concluded and made a case that we all knew intuitively, which is that there's an enormous cost to the inadequacies of our current childcare system. Uh, that cost is pegged at conservatively $2.7 billion annually. Uh, and that $2.7 billion annually, annually is a function of lost wages for families, lost revenue to companies, and lost tax revenue to state government. And again, that's a conservative figure. And for those reasons, uh, we have committed ourselves uh, to advocating uh, for, among other things, advancements in the state budget. Um, and so there I wanna to pivot to some information on that front. Um, before we talk about the budget, I think it's, uh, it's imperative that we kind of understand what the economy for early childhood education looks like it in Massachusetts. Who's paying for childcare? Um, so the state budget is part of the solution, but actually when you think about the three primary payers, families, the federal government, and state government, state government right now is actually dead last and it's not even close. Families pay well over a billion dollars, I'd say conservatively pegged at $1.2 billion out of their own pockets. And that's for the formal childcare system. Federal government pays about $600 million annually. State pays about $300 million annually. Um, compare that, by the way, the state investment of $300 million to what the state invests in K-12, which is over $5 billion annually. And you get a sense of perspective on just how small the state investment really is within the space and just how big of a burden uh, paying for childcare is for families. Because again, if the state pulled back on its $5 billion investment in K-12, imagine what that would mean for those families who are seeking to educate their kindergartners through 12th grade. Um, we are looking right now at a budget picture uh, that really provides significant opportunity. Um, the state has been running annual surpluses for the last several years. 
And that, I think, provides us with a real platform for making the kind of sustained, significant commitment to funding the early childhood education system that the state hasn't done previously. In FY21, the state had a $2.1 billion surplus. In FY22, uh, we're currently projecting to have a $2.6 billion surplus. And again, these are unexpended tax revenues that could be prioritized for early childhood education. And of course, we'd argue that they should be prioritized for early childhood education. Another opportunity is something that the state has already made a financial commitment to, which is something known as the Student Opportunity Act. It's new funding for our school districts. And among the priorities that were identified within that was preschool. Uh, and that act is intended to provide an additional $1.4 billion to our districts over the course of the next seven years. And again, uh, prioritized within that could be pre-K, which would be a real opportunity uh, to provi provide meaningful assistance to families. Um, and as I noted earlier, there's new federal funding and we've advocated for it as a coalition. Uh, there's still about $200 million of unexpended ARPA for childcare that the state can use to launch these efforts. Uh, that's one-time funding. And the state still has about two and a half billion dollars of flexible discretionary ARPA funding that it could put towards childcare. So between that unexpended state revenue, those one-time funds, there are literally billions of dollars in the state right now that could be applied to solving this child care crisis. You're gonna be hearing later from Sandy and others about some of the legislative proposals uh, that are currently before the state, but I wanted to just conclude by noting one other uh, important feature of what's going on at the state level, and that's the EEC uh, Review Commission that was set up by the legislature last year, and our business coalition really actively participated on that. It was a legislative commission that was set up uh, of legislators and of lay, lay people and advocates and experts. Uh, the goal was to study early education and care funding and ways to support the Commonwealth's goal of expanding equitable access to high quality early education and care. Uh, the focus was on sustainable long-term uh, funding systems that would provide high quality and accessibility and affordability. Um, so you're hearing these themes as was the theme for our coalition vision. Uh, 29 members participated in this effort. They conducted 10 meetings over the course of the last year, and they released their report in March. And they released the report in four uh, focal areas. The four focal areas around program stabilization, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we need to make sure that there is sustainability for early childhood education operators if they're gonna be available to provide the services that families need. It was around family access and affordability. affordability. Massachusetts has the most expensive childcare on average of any state in the country. We do, uh, fortunately, I guess, have the District of Columbia, which is more expensive than we are, but if you were to just look purely at the states, we have the unfortunate distinction of being number one in terms of expense. And then, as Amy pointed out, the workforce is an enormous uh, issue and challenge that needs to be solved. Compensation, sourcing, uh, providing professional advancement was the third category. And finally, we need to invest in our systems of early childhood education uh, so that programs and families uh, and early childhood educators have the supports that they need. So the report uh, provided uh, recommendations for between 900 million to 1.5 billion of uh, additional annual investment in the early childhood education system. Those recommendations are broken into immediate, near-term and long-term categories. Uh, and we've already seen some action or some progress on this front as we all advocate behind this. Governor Baker uh, proposed $450 million in child care stabilization grants as part of a supplemental budget that he brought forward. That was part of the commission's recommendations. The House of Representatives, which is finalizing its budget recommendation this week, uh, they already have proposed $70 million of additional funding uh, to provide additional support to our subsidized child care uh, programs uh, and to uh, several other programs that relate to subsidized care and to family affordability. And we're going to be moving on to the Senate very soon. And we're going to want to follow uh, the advocacy path that Amy laid out for us in her recommendation as we moved into that next stage. So that's the picture right now uh, for my seat at the state level. It's one in which nothing is assured. And if we don't lean hard into this, as I said at the very beginning of my remarks, the politics are stacked against early education and care. We've got to make sure that we fill that vacuum uh, with powerful voices to really move this agenda. We're trying to do that through this business coalition. We'd welcome your participation in this business coalition. Uh, and we wanna do it in collaboration with other fine advocates like those who are on the panel with me today. Great, thank you, Tom.
Thank you very much. That, that was a great overview. Are there any questions for Tom? There's a lot of information coming up, a lot of numbers. <laughs> so I'll be happy. But this being recorded, I, 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 I did share, I just uh, for those that were trying to keep up, and I'm sorry if I went heavy on the facts, but I did share um, some of my talking points that I know they're going to be redistributed after. And Amy, of course, is uh, sharing your information as well. So hopefully you'll have access to that. And I'm looking at the chat. I'm not sure if there might be a question there. Is the, is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, regarding its employees affiliated with the Business Coalition uh, for Early Education and Care? No, the Commonwealth is not uh, affiliated. None of the, um, of the state agencies uh, are part of this. I will confess that part of our design in creating this business coalition was to uh, create a group of employers uh, and of business groups that weren't necessarily uh, tied to the state or to early childhood education providers themselves. There are associations that represent early childhood education providers. They already exist. Um, and the, a primary uh, recipient of our advocacy efforts is in fact state government. So we wanted to create a business group um, that, was, um, that was really, uh, what's probably the best way of phrasing it, um, did not have any sort of direct self-interest or wouldn't be accused necessarily uh, of advocacy that would have um, direct benefits to our own employ employee employers because they were child care providers themselves. We wanted to create a voice that really was representative of the broader business community whose employees rely on early childhood education in order to be engaged and productive in the workforce. So no, the Commonwealth is not part of, of this effort, but we work very, very closely with the Department of Early Education and Care and a number of other state agencies through our public-private partnerships. Great, thank you, Tom. Any thank you. I, I have one question for you, Tom, because I think you did a great job outlining sort of the economics of childcare. Uh, but you know, on the Cape, we see so we have staffing issues across the board, huge staffing issues in childcare and early education. But here, if you're the Cape Codder and you run a hotel and you can't find people from the front desk, you raise wages, right? So you get That's right. twenty dollars an hour working on the front desk at the Cape Codder. Uh, now, because the market just forces that decision. How? Meanwhile, I think we're paying, you know, frontline childcare workers about fourteen dollars now. That's so, correct, Paul. How closely linked are wages for for uh, frontline childcare workers to uh, federal and state funding? Um, very directly linked, because as I noted earlier, Massachusetts families are already paying for the most expensive childcare on average in the country. There's really not much you can do to shift the expenses of childcare to families. To pay for full-time infant care over the course of a year, um, you're looking at something close to $20,000 on average. Now you have multiple children and you multiply that across infant care, preschool, toddler care. Um, you're, you're, you're immediately, if you weren't already at the beginning, you're immediately into something that's not sustainable for families. So there's really no way to shift the expenses of this. Uh, onto the, the shoulders of families, which is why I started there, to make sure that people are clear that that's where the burden currently resides. So it's an absolute imperative if we are going to solve the early childhood education workforce crisis, which is really the crisis within our broader labor market crisis that I mentioned earlier, it's imperative that we see uh, a more significant public investment at the federal level and the state level. And we definitely need those federal dollars. I, I, it won't be achievable to get to our ambitions to rely simply on an additional state investment. We need both. And we need more companies to get involved to the extent that they can in providing some supports to their employees. And we do have companies, um, in fact, one of my favorite to point to is Siemens Bank, uh, which is on Cape Cod. They have had a longstanding relationship with an early childhood education provider whereby Siemens provides uh, financial support to secure a certain number of seats, which Siemens may or may not use. They always do though, because the demand exceeds uh, the, the capacity, but they provide subsidy support for those seats, which provides really a win-win-win. It's a win for the childcare provider because that is a reliable source of revenue for them, um, which is needed in a very, very tight, um, uh, you know, uh, business model in early childhood education. It's certainly a win for the families who are able to access more affordable care 
than they otherwise would have been able to access. And it's a win for Siemens because it's it's part of what helps them to attract and retain employees who might otherwise have reason to leave the area uh, or certainly at least leave Siemens Bank. So uh, all that being said, you know, employers have a role to play, but to your point, Paul, um, to really get to the big solve is going to require a very uh, important fundamental shift in the way we consider early childhood education as a public policy. And it really needs to put it on par in many ways with the way we think about public education, which is again, why I mentioned earlier that if you were to take the $5 billion out of the state budget for K-12, I think we'd all be having uh, a very different conversation about what's wrong within our education system because someone's going to be able to operate with that. Great, thank, thank you, Tom. I, I just, I do find it interesting that the state legislature often in response to, to businesses saying, you know, we have staffing problems, we have housing problems, they say, well, pay your people more. But they're the, they're, they need to be the actors that happen on the childcare front in, in order for those frontline childcare wages to increase. It's, it's going to take a partnership of all of us. I think it's, it's certainly going to take uh, more activity on the state's part. I I'm certainly would I agree with that. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an area that's different from K-12 in as much as this, there is, a, there is a legal basis for public education, which is found in the state constitution. It's never been interpreted to apply uh, to early childhood education. And so I, I really think that the long-term solution to early childhood education is gonna rely heavily on, on stronger public support. But it's also for those reasons, uh, something that's gonna require a real strong public-private partnership, which is why I think it's great that the advocacy community particularly through the work that Strategies for Children has done, um, but, but also with the emergence of this business coalition with uh, the Massachusetts Early Childhood Funders Collaborative, which is a group of philanthropies, including philanthropies on the Cape. Why all of those parties are working so closely together, this is what we could do to be uh, of assistance fashioning uh, an agenda that would draw upon public and private resources to move this forward. Great. Well, thank you, Tom. I think the, the the relevancy of your group and the coalition being formed and advocating now, and what we're trying to mirror and support here on the Cape, I don't think we can underline enough the fact that we have the Gen General Appropriations Act, the state budget that's moving now. We have probably a, the largest supplemental that's ever gone along with that that's gonna move with it for a series of smaller supplementals that still add up to a big one. And then we have still $2 billion, which is half of what the, of the ARPA funds that the state received. There's never been a better time when we look at the finances to advocate uh, for the kind of systemic change and investment that we need uh, right now. So- Paul, thank you. And thanks for your personal support, Paul, and for Noel's personal support, but, but thank you very much for the support of the Cape Chamber. Great. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Any chat questions? Yeah, there is a question in the chat. Uh, if choice benefits for employees with employers being considered to include daycare as a benefit, if other benefits are not required, I think I got that right. Choice benefits required. Is choice benefits, if other benefits are not needed? So I think, I, so um, I, I think this will answer the question. So there's not a mature market for childcare benefits. And when I say that, I, what, I would, what I would note is when we've surveyed employers about what they're doing to support their employees around these matters, the vast majority of employers have said, well, what we've done is, is we've created greater flexibility in scheduling and greater flexibility in uh, where people can work, right? Um, which was a logical thing to do in the early days of the pandemic, creating flexibility when you didn't know uh, for instance, what the pandemic, you know, how long the pandemic was going to last, what the deep impacts of the pandemic would be. Creating flexibility is a good short-term solution. It's not a long-term solution. As we've continued to survey and talk to our members over the course of, of uh, the last two years, and particularly over the last year post our launch, we have seen a stronger interest in our, on our members' part in thinking about providing more direct assistance. So childcare subsidies, providing some form of childcare benefits. The market doesn't exist right now. So we actually kind of need to create that in parallel. Um, and so I think getting to a place in which more employees would actually have an option uh, to, to select uh, a child care benefit with their employer um, is something that's going to be part of the solution. I, I truly believe that, that we're going to arrive at a time when there will be a, a robust offering of child care benefits. 
Um, but that design work is really underway right now. It might also fit with uh, a public policy agenda, which is to say, maybe there should be some incentives for employers to do this in the same way that employers have been incentivized to offer health care for many, many decades to employees. So we want to continue to think about what employers can do absent government support, but we also want to think about what we might be able to do in partnership with government to make sure that as many employers as possible, especially small employers, uh, are able to participate you know, in a system that would meet the needs of their prospective and incumbent employees uh, as far as childcare is concerned. And so that's, that's a feature of the work that we're trying to do as a business coalition. And we're gonna to continue to do that in partnership uh, with the state and with others as we think about what the employer role can truly be. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Thank so you. We are gonna move on to our next speaker right now, uh, Sandy Fadiman Silva, the chapter coordinator for the Cape and Islands Common Start Coalition. Sandy, welcome. Thank you. Uh, do you want me to present from here, right here? You do whatever is comfortable. If you feel like standing up would be uh, better for you, that's that's fine. Sure. Hi, I'm Sandy Fadiman Silva. I live in Falmouth and I am a retired professor of anthropology from Bridgewater State University where I uh, have taught for more than 30 years. Um, and uh, I am the mother of three men at the moment. And my childcare story uh, began when my oldest son, who's now 51, almost 52, was one year old. And I was a single mother uh, raising him as a, a single parent. His father never did pay child support. And I did have uh, an opportunity to find a good job out in Western Mass and put him into child care, but it was very difficult to pay the bills um, on my rather limited salary and pay my um, rent and uh, provide for his needs. So I had to leave my job and go on public assistance. Uh, so my story is that nothing has really changed for young mothers like me. Uh, in the 50 years since I faced this crisis. And we still see childcare as a huge obstacle for women, especially, to enter the workforce and remain in the workforce. And it has long term detrimental consequences for us in terms of longevity at the workplace, retirement benefits, uh, promotions. Uh, and uh, different kinds of professional development opportunities. Uh, and I just also wanted to mention that the lack of child care has long-term consequences for our society in terms of the detrimental effects to the children themselves. And there's substantial research to show that infants and children zero to five will enter into uh, child care settings uh, do much better in terms of various life outcomes. They have better health outcomes. They earn more money over the lifetime of their careers. Uh, they um, uh, they uh, experience uh, connections with criminal activity, incarceration, uh, mental health problems, physical health problems than do infants and children who do participate in early educational care. Um, the brain is growing during those first five years at a tremendous rate. Early learning is so fundamental to the positive adult outcomes. So we, the best investment our society can make is for early education and care. It brings uh, multiple uh, benefits per dollar spent. Uh, so I just want to preface my comments about that. Now, I am uh, the coordinator of the Cape and Islands chapter of the Common Start Coalition. Now, I have to, I have to confess that Tom and Amy are both on our steering committee uh, of the statewide uh, Common Start campaign. Uh, we have a large steering committee. We have uh, seven regional chapters six geographic chapters and the Spanish language chapter of the Common Start campaign. And I have a short, uh, I have just a few slides here, but what is the Common Start campaign? It is a statewide partnership of organizations, providers, and individuals working together to make high quality, 
early education and child care affordable and accessible to all Massachusetts families. Our goal is to ensure that all children in the Commonwealth have the same strong start and enter school on a level playing field. Our vision is to deliver affordable and accessible care of the highest quality for all children, regardless of where they live, what language is their first language, whether they come to life with uh, physical challenges, whether they uh, do not speak English as their first language, uh, and other differences uh, that enrich us. So what is the common, and, and I just want to mention just quickly, um, currently on the Cape, communities are um, investing in early education and care, but it's really woefully inadequate. Uh, Tom mentioned Siemens Bank, so um, the business um, community, uh, some, some businesses on the Cape and Islands have early education and child care grants for their employees, as was mentioned, Siemens Bank, Eastern Bank, Cape Air, Updo, and I'm sure there are others. There are pre-K and pre-pre-K programs uh, throughout uh, the Cape and Islands, Bowen, Brewster, Chatham, East Ham, Mashpee, Provincetown, West Yarmouth, Falmouth, um, all have pre-K and or pre-pre-K programs, so we're going to hear about some of those. Uh, we also have early education and care cash subsidy programs, voucher programs. Chatham has a wonderful voucher program, Provincetown, Truro, Wealthy, East, and East Ham also do. I submitted a town meeting petition article in Falmouth for $75,000 of voucher programs, only to have it voted down in town meeting. So I was very unhappy. But we did create a task force on workforce sustainability so they know that. It is a huge problem. But mostly what I'm going to talk about is the, the Common Start bill. And Common Start uh, created a, um, was created, I should say, to um, solve the crisis in early education and care. And incorporated into our vision, thank you, was that uh, we would create a piece of legislation, which became known as the Common Start Bill, about three years ago we started this, uh, that would tackle the crisis of early education and care. It was a template, it is a template. Uh, like when you build a house, you need to have house plans drawn up before you put a shovel in the ground or you borrow money from a bank, uh, so you know the roadmap for how to construct that home. Well, this is the roadmap for how to solve the early education and care crisis. And many experts were at the table for more than a year hammering out various components of how would a early education and care system work in our Commonwealth and throughout the US. Um, if this is passed, which we hope it will be, it will be the first state in the US to pass such legislation. It is really landmark legislation. The bill introduces a child care affordability framework, essentially with two parts, uh, one of which is so called bedrock funding that invests in the facilities themselves. And the other is investments and subsidies for families. So to reduce the affordable cost of care, as was mentioned, for a single infant, Care may cost twenty thousand or more in Massachusetts. For a toddler, it's about sixteen thousand five hundred. Most families cannot afford that. It's more than a mortgage or rent in virtually any family. So the bill um, has fundamental principles that um, in, the, one of which is that investment in early education and care should reflect the actual cost of care because our Commonwealth and with federal support does not spend enough money to pay for the actual cost of child care. It would be like investing in public education K through 12, but only investing about a third of what K through 12 actually needs. And we probably don't invest enough already, but um, in the early education care sector, it is impossible. 
One of the fundamental um, components is that no family would pay more than 7% of their annual income on early education and care. And, and families at 50% or below a state median income would pay nothing for childcare. 7% is what the federal government has determined is an affordable level. And people at the highest income level would pay the full cost because 7% is uh, less than, or, um, you know, they have more income than 7% would not apply. Another feature is that early education and care must meet the realistic needs of the whole child and family, including after school, summer, school vacations, and care during non traditional hours, because most families, many families, do not work nine to five. They may have to work weekends, nights, um, summer vacations, school vacations have to be accounted for. And for uh, the, the bill does include language to provide that type of care um, for children of, um, up to age 12, ages 5 to 12, for school age children needing after school care. And for children to age 17 who have special needs. So this is written into the bill. Another component is that employers, uh, employees in early education and care who currently earn about half what the K through 12 comparable teachers earn, they earn a little more than 30,000 a year as average wages. Um, uh, they would uh, receive. Um, Pay that was comparable to the K through 12 system. And they would also have employee benefits such as health insurance and professional development opportunities. Another um, component is that, again, the bedrock funding paid directly to facilities based on the number of seats that that facility serves. So if you have 10 children in your facility, you would receive bedrock funding supports for 10. If one of those children moved out of the district and was no longer at your facility, you wouldn't immediately lose one tenth of your support. Um, it would be retained based on the number of seats, which is a very important part of the success of this kind of program. And this funding would support the cost of materials, supplies, new technologies, advanced technologies, facility enhancements, and uh, raising wages. In sum, the federal, state, local resources uh, brought would, um, would be brought together to invest based on the real cost of care made available to allow working families to uh, be able to afford child care. Um, let's look at the next slide, please. What is in the House budget again? It was already alluded that the budget's um, process is moving along. The House is still deliberating on the budget. Again, this is a state plan, so it's a state budget. And um, there are some very positive, um, some positive language, particularly based on the Education Commission uh, report that was alluded to by Tom. 91 million in new state funding mostly earmarked to support low-income family voucher programs. So that funding is beneficial, certainly, to the low-income families. $60 million for early education uh, provider salary increases and $10, more, 10 million more for personal child care expenses to the providers. Uh, so these are very beneficial. And the facility subsidy schedule will be based on, again, on enrollment, not attendance, which is an important part. But what's missing is a problem. Um, increases in subsidies for low-income families are um, in the bill. There is not funding that addresses the high cost of private pay for um, middle-income families, lower middle and middle-income families who are not eligible for vouchers and voucher the voucher system currently has a waiting list sometimes as many as 20,000 children so it's woefully underfunded it also does not meet the seven percent target income threshold that is written into the common start bill and it does not um, address the funding for what we call webinar services for children with special needs economic needs breakfast and lunch for example transportation 
after school and extended hours for children uh, ages 5 to 12 or 5 to 17. And the so-called C3 funding, which is federal funding, has not yet materialized. So we are concerned. And just in conclusion, again, over the past three years, the Common Star Coalition has elevated the importance of making high quality early education and care affordable and accessible to all Massachusetts families, compensating early educators for the value of their work and ensuring that providers receive the true cost of quality care. I think our message is breaking through and we really hope that, they, uh, that the public will continue to support this effort along with the business community and many, many other stakeholders that are on board with us, including the Take by Chamber. Thank you, Susan. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Just just to go back to the um, the family benefit section. So median income in Massachusetts is eighty seven thousand. Was I think that's twenty twenty number? All right. It, it's about <coughs> this is, I think sixty four five sixty four thousand five hundred for a family of three, of two. So eighty seven mother and child. And it's I'm not sure exactly what it is. It may, in fact, 64.5 may be for a family of three. Meets state median income. Right. Okay, so so people that so families of three that make less than thirty five thousand would or sixty four thousand five hundred would be would be pay nothing for child care. And then no one else in the state would pay more than seven percent. Seven percent. Yes. So five thousand. Four thousand. Okay. I don't mean to depend, depend, right. depend, depend, yeah. <laughs> I have to do that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I obviously can't do it because I have to play. <laughs> I, I do it like 1% is 64,000 is 6,400, so it's 64,200. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's great. So, status is done? Well, the bill, the bill is currently before the State Education Committee. Uh, they are delivering on it. Um, much of what the State Education uh, Funding Review Commission recommended was in, consistent with the Common Star Bill. So we're very pleased that they did speak to all, a lot of the issues that were raised in the Common Star Bill. But the bill is now moving through the State Education Committee. It has to be sent out of committee by uh, May 4th, uh, 5th, I believe. Okay, so, well, thank you very much. Are there any questions for Sandy? No? Okay, we're going to move to our next speaker this evening, which is Jackie Beebe, the town administrator from Easttown. Uh, because I think it is amazing on how, how much municipalities are trying to do and, and move in this sphere. And so we've invited uh, three of the municipalities who want to hear from each of them in hopes that it might be able to lead some best practices that we talk to the So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll try and do, I know we're trending behind schedule, so I'm going to try and do a little speed presentation. Um, in 2018, the town of East End completed a strategic planning process. One of the four goals of that process, um, and we're taking it very seriously, we're following the strategic plan. One of the four goals was to increase the diversity of our community in all ways. And we meant age diversity. We were specifically like most big towns trending towards over 60. We don't want to be over 60. We want a community that's robust and represents everybody. So the select board challenged me specifically in 2019 to design a program that would support families and children, keep the ones that we have, encourage more to come. It was that simple. That's what they wanted. And so obviously child care for us on the outer Cape, it's just like every other town, just a little bit worse. So housing, child care, the accessibility and the affordability of it, which I think are intertwined. Um, the distance to employment adds time, even, you know, net, now since COVID, maybe not so much, but it adds time for a parent to get to and from. So the average little seven hour a day thing doesn't work as well. Um, and of course, huge gaps in after school, before school, summer programs and nutrition programs, believe it or not. So anyway, um, I took a look at preschool for three and four year olds as the centerpiece and figured out 
how much all the programs cost and, and what it would ran numbers basically and then took a look at how best to add an economic development boost so like other speakers have said you know we don't want to undermine the very system that we're trying to build up i did not want to create anything that wouldn't support the child care programs that already existed in our community so they needed to benefit from this and i needed to figure out a way to pay them on a regular basis like businesses need to be paid because some of the other towns did have voucher pro programs but they were being paid every six months or quarterly and that just doesn't work for a child care provider so you have to keep that in mind too and then uh, a member <laughs> I remember the finance he said, and I just read an article in the New York Times that kids do better in school if they eat. <laughs> and I was like, great, wow. you know, really just throw in another thing for me to worry about. So I called the elementary school thinking, you know, we're pretty wealthy town. I'm sure all the kids are eating. They're like, no, 40% of our kids eat breakfast at school. So I'm like, okay, shoot, I have to work that in too. So Basically, the package that I presented to the board for their review included free preschool for all residents for three-year-olds and four-year-olds. We decided to do a half day for three-year-olds and a full day for four-year-olds, figuring that that was, you know, a reasonable starting place. Um, and by free, I mean a regular school preschool day, so we'll pay up to $10,000 for each child. It is not income based, it is an entitlement. So anyone who has is a resident and who lives in East End gets it. We also added free school lunches, including either breakfast or lunch, so that kids wouldn't have to worry about it. They could just go through the line and eat lunch. The school bills us directly. Um, we set aside $100,000 a year out of this for housing that was attainable, not necessarily in the affordable income range, but for households that made a little more money that we wanted to start to develop some specific programs to help people perhaps with mortgage down payments or other things that families needed. They were out there, they could make money if they had childcare, if they had a little assistance. So you, you get where I'm going. And then we subsidized our summer food programs, um, to make food insecurity a non-issue uh, and added some support for the existing after-school program that we had and for some of the our extended our day for our summer youth programs. Um, it was presented to the voters as an override and I presented it this way, you know, this is, <laughs> this is not an option. This is not an optional service. This is, we provide police services. When you call 911, someone comes to your door, that's a necessity, right? Road work is a necessity. Preschool is a necessity. And we have to start looking at it as a necessity. And the town agreed and they funded it over, it was over 80% of the vote. So it was more than a two thirds majority. And they also passed an override to pay for it. So it's been in, in place for about three years. We're serving so pretty much 40 kids continuously year round, sometimes more, sometimes a little less. Um, we've also had, now we have contracts with 13 different child care providers. Um, we're paying them monthly. So they bill us at the end of the month and we pay them within five days. Um, and I have to say of all the things that I've done in East Ham, you know, I've gotten more support and encouragement from this than anything else. I've had parents, you know, cry on the phone to me and say the same things. You know, I couldn't work. My husband is losing work because of COVID and I couldn't work and now I can and thank you very much. Um, what's shocked me about it is how judicious parents have been with the service. I just assumed that they would use the full extent of the benefit. And they don't. They they decided. A woman's decided. You know, I'm going to go back to work Tuesdays and Thursdays, and that's what I feel comfortable with. And that's now I have childcare, and we can do that. So it's it's not using up all of our money that we've set aside already. Um, and then lastly, I just I guess 
I wanted to say that on the federal level, on the state level, and I'm a total advocate for, for Common Start, but municipal governments, government should solve problems and increase access for people to services that they need, right? That's what we're designed to do. And everyone should be demanding that that's what we do. And we've shown that when that happens, you know, it occurs. And even though East Ham is 60% over the age of 60, those people voted to support this program because they realized how important it was. So, so I think we, we do need to focus our strategic goals on the gaps in our services in our community and, and work to provide those gaps, not just do what we normally do every day. So the other thing, so two more things, access for me, is not about physical location or access for me has three elements you know does what you need exist and if it doesn't we have to create it right if it exists can you afford it and if you if it exists and you can afford it then can you get to it or can it come to you if you don't need to say yes to all three of those elements something is not accessible to you so it's not just about physical mobility or economics. It, there's a lot of factors that we have to, to think about. And for me, the big issue in summary is the conversation that childcare preschool is essential. It's not an optional service. We can no longer consider it an optional service. Um, so we've done two things to expand our childcare this past year, expand our services. We put that uh, housing money aside. We have now a, a five-year plan. The town is uh, hopefully Monday night going to endure spending almost $2 million this year alone on housing across the income spectrum. So from affordable all the way to 200% of AMI, we're going to design programs that will help our citizens access housing and create more units of housing. And we extended that child care benefit to all our employees. So now if you're an employee of the town of East you can get the same benefit as a resident in terms of the child care. And that's that's where we are right now. Great. Thank you, Jackie. That is it incredible. So that's it, right? I was I was back, right? you were very good. <laughs> we have plenty of time. But I think we are going to collapse all the questions into the, to the end, because uh, I think a lot of things are popping up. How, how much did the TCM budget for the budget? Half a million dollars. It's a half a million dollar override. Right, override. And how big is the TCM budget? Uh, 30 million. 30 million. Um, and this is on the municipal side, right? No, we all, yeah. all the tax levy. Great. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, OK, so our next speaker. Uh, is going to be Gail Briere, who's the chair of the Orleans School Committee. For those of, of us who live uh, west of the Bass River, they're right next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and before I begin, I would like to recognize the person who not only inspired us to um, bring financial support to the parents in Orleans, but also provided us with guidance and support along the way. Jackie Bebe, oh, <laughs> um, through her vision and a preliminary task that she paid, we were able to benefit from her experience, allowing us to bring our vision to reality within a year's time, which was what we see. The process for us began in January of 2021, when the Orleans School Committee got to connect with the Finance Committee to discuss the budget process and what the school committee valued in education. This included our views on the importance of preschool opportunities for all children. As a result of this robust discussion, the Finance Committee actually encouraged the school committee to pursue additional funding for preschool education. This led to a meeting with Jackie um, and myself last spring, followed by a school committee meeting in June, where Jackie presented what the town of East Ham was doing to support its citizens with young children. Both the select board and the finance committee were invited to attend to ensure their involvement from the very beginning. During that meeting, the school committee voted 
to pursue a town supported preschool program and take the lead on bringing it to fruition. This is where the real work began for us. In order to bring forth an article to the Orleans voters to approve funding for this cause, a lot of background information was required to build our case. How many preschoolers were actually living in Orleans? How many Orleans children were currently being serviced? What eligibility criteria should be considered? What preschools were available to our children? What was the cost associated with these preschools? Who should be eligible for town funding? And why was this proposal so important? Tracking down the number of preschoolers in our town proved to be more challenging than expected. In checking with the town census, we discovered that many parents didn't list their children until they were ready to go to kindergarten. We decided to contact the preschools in our area and specifically ask for the number of three-year-olds and four-year-olds from Orleans. We identified 49 children in surrounding preschools, but felt those numbers did not really adequately represent the population as we were in the middle of COVID and knew that homeschooling or the inability to afford childcare could very well have impacted the total number. So we looked back at 15 years of kindergarten enrollment and found that it was a relatively stable number of between 30 and 35 children entering Orleans Elementary every year, and then estimated 33 children at each age group for a total of 66 children. In determining age eligibility, we followed the school guidelines for entering kindergarten used in August 31st as the cutoff for being three or four. Parents would need to be Orleans residents, be able to provide proof of their residency and a copy of their child's birth certificate. To be an eligible preschool required, preschool required that it be licensed and agree with the to work with the town as a vendor. A child from Orleans could be town funded in any of our neighboring towns, provided that these criteria were met. We identified preschools in eight towns that easily met those conditions and also included town funding for our community friends attending the Nauset Integrated Preschool. Establishing how much the town would pay for age level required research on what each preschool is charging and looking at the types of services they were providing. Ultimately, we opted to fund what ESTAN did up to $5,000 per year for three-year-olds and up to $10,000 per year for four-year-olds based on the child's age as of August 31st of the school year. Services outside of the designated preschool academic time would continue to be paid by the parents. Perhaps the most controversial aspect of our proposal was whether funding would be based on the parents' finances. We felt strongly that it should be based on residency, age, and vendor selection because we wanted these children to have access to these early educational programs just like other school programs. Everyone pays for education via property taxes, and that is not based on income, so the concept is the same. The second reason we wanted this program to be equal across the board was that it supported parents working or being able to work more, which would build our local economy and help cost burdened parents better pay for housing and other expenses. We don't have any local tax breaks for families, you can't legally give them one. This is a subsidy that helps families and our local businesses. And finally, a more practical issue is that if something is income-based, it would then require a physician just to administer it. You would have to develop a means test, proof of income, and someone who would have to collect and verify. This is not a normal town function. This might be a good time to point out that although the Orleans School Committee was bringing forward this proposal, funds to support it would not be linked to the school budget. It was designed to be a standalone program supported by the Town of Orleans and overseen by the Town of Orleans. The school committee's role was to get an article to the special town meeting in October so that citizens could vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $495,000 for the purpose of funding universal preschool educational opportunities contingent on the passage of the Proposition 2.5 override. At, um, 
that will vote will be at the town meeting and at the polls. Once our research was completed, two school committee members met with our new interim superintendent the second month she was on the job to develop the language for this article. Neither school committee member had any experience with this, but Brooke Lynch did. She collaborated with us and sought out the advice of legal counsel to ensure we were, we were presenting it appropriately. In September of 2021, we were ready to officially go before the select board and the finance committee to secure their support. We also participated in a special citizens forum where the focus was on what the citizens of Orleans would be voting on as overrides at the polls. With each presentation that took place, participants posed questions that required us to clarify information, and these questions served to make us better prepared for the town meeting. We de developed a list of frequently asked questions, posted them on the town website, and distributed them, distributed them at the special town meeting and at the voting polls. On October 25th, the town of Orleans passed the article at the special town meeting, and on November 2nd, 2021, they voted at the polls to support it. One month later, within a month, on December 1st, the town of Orleans had the program up and running. Although I periodically check on the number of vendors and children involved, this program is being overseen entirely by the town of Orleans. This past Monday at our school committee meeting, the director of pupil services informed us that the integrated preschool conducted a survey in January of 2022 to find out from current and incoming preschool parents whether they would want to see the current model of four and a half days expanded to five full days for preschoolers in the coming school year. 75% of parents wanted to see a full day model. Moving forward, the NASA integrated preschool will offer both models for parents. Now, an integrated preschool consists of seven identified special needs children with eight community friends. Special needs children don't have to pay any tuition. For the half day model, the tuition for the year is $1,600. For the full day model, the tuition for the year will be $4,000, and that will be covered entirely by the town of Orleans. I'd like to think that as a result of our push for more opportunities for preschool education and the conversations that she and I had regarding half day programs, not necessarily meeting parents and children's needs, that it was a small part to what prompted a closer look at what we were offering in our district. Parents have spoken and NASA has responded appropriately. In closing, and I'm looking at this from my little town of Orleans, which is very different from the big world that I've come to realize is not as, as easy for everyone as it is for us right now. But a lingering concern for me is whether there will be enough preschools to service the number of children that will now be able to afford to attend. The future hope is that new preschools will, will be formed knowing that parents will not face the financial obstacles from the past because town support has proven that we value what they have to offer children. Thank you very much. Incredible. And uh, Orleans demographically is the oldest community on the Cape. Uh, and in you know, order from once upon a time there was a, a concern, or well, there was a belief that those towns that had older populations wouldn't vote for school over. Right. Absolutely untrue. In fact, the opposite is true. The older the demographic, the more likely they are to fund a school override. So but you have to go out there and you have to sell it. You have to sell it to you have to get the the um, select board and the finance committee in with you on, from the get-go. And then you have to do the research and then you have to go back to them and say, this is why we need this. And when they provide opportunities for you to go in front of the public and, and answer those questions, you do that. And then you create, you know, like a, a frequently asked questions that consist of two pages. And when people come to the polls or they're, or, you know, when they're at the town meeting, he hand this to them and let them see that there, all your questions are being answered right there. I'll just speak to it, but 
you can take it home and you can think about it. So it really, it really worked. And, and actually, Jackie was such an inspiration to us. And we just took a fraction of what she did and just concentrated on the preschool because as a school committee, that's where our primary concern is. But it's like dominoes, you know, I went to Orleans at Orleans and made Nossett come to fruition. We're all going to force the comments. Yeah, we, well, we are 15 communities that are very different yes. yeah. until one of them stands out and doing so, and then the peer pressure gets <laughs> So now, not so that you don't think that innovation and caring for children only happens east of the Bass River. <laughs> we have had the Board of Superintendent of uh, the town of Matt for Mashpee. And Mashpee is the, the fastest growing community on the Cape for the last 50 years and some really innovative stuff. In the so I'm super excited to be here. I've learned quite a bit. I want to work from them. And you may mention about 15 towns. We as a group of superintendents try to be cohesive. And at the beginning of COVID, we were like, all right, we're going to do this together because we don't want the comparisons. And it just doesn't work because we have these unique qualities in our towns that are, are somewhat different. I've been in Mashpee for quite a while, and we have a town that really values education. So just for an example of that, for the 27 plus years I've been in Mashpee, kindergarten is always full day and free for families, while in surrounding towns that haven't made it that way yet. We do have an integrated preschool, which is the 2.9 year old, and the same kind of thing where, you know, there are students that need early intervention, and then there are sort of their um, normalized peers. So we have that class, but it was in, we're in the ninth year of offering um, the universal four year old program. It's a full day, five day program that does not cost the families anything. The first year was 13, 14. They did sort of a study um, and we had the impact of the local preschools in our towns. We do have a um, pretty active kids club, which is run by our, our town rec department. I think they have a sliding scale for um, those fees. But um, so that was that first year. So the, the 14 15 school year was the pilot year of a four year old program. That year, and I think the second year, there were two years that we actually offered some bus transportation in that as well, because transportation is still sort of a snag for me that I'm trying to problem solve. But so we, we have about 62 kids in the four year old program. It's funny that it hasn't really grown over that time. It's, I mean, it dipped down, way down in uh, 2021 uh, because of COVID. It was about 32 because we understood families didn't want to send their preschool to school and wear masks, all of that. Uh, but it has held pretty consistently. We try to predict our kindergarten. We look at actually birth rates and uh, mass be my biggest concern as we continue to, to provide these opportunities for families is the housing piece because we all on the Cape are experiencing our a decline in our student enrollments. And we, we try to problem solve that all the time, but it really is a housing issue. There's plenty of job opportunities. They're pretty well paying positions, but they just can't seem to find a place to live for their families. And um, so back to the preschool, we have four sections of our four-year-old program. We have about 15. And when we first started it in that first year, and I, it was around 500,000, and that was back then, because the biggest piece is your salaries for each room has a teacher and a paraprofessional. Uh, we have it housed in our pre K to two building, which personally is what I love because it really orients students to sort of what it's like to, to be in school and then you're going to stay there all the way to that school it goes to second grade. But when I go in and watch what goes on in these classrooms, it's it's that opportunity just for an enhanced literacy exposure. It's that socialization. I always talk to people about that particular school. And, you know, kids do well if they can, and if they can't, it's a skill deficit. So when you have those, they are the cutest if you need to perk up your day or fill your cup, <laughs> which, you know, all the last year or so, I need to fill my cup quite a bit. You go in these classrooms, and they are just the faces of hope and innocence and sponges. And so that opportunity for families, when we had the free for, for our four-year-olds, it made me look at the integrated program. And that like trickled in money of like, in the end, it was about 13,000 a year for certain families because special ed families weren't having to pay. So I said, this is ridiculous. We're not going to charge families for this, but it is part of our budget. Our school budget's about 24 million, 1,500 kids. 
um, it's always been part of it, so I don't see that going. And um, back, I wasn't part of the, the forming of it that first year to know exactly where we pulled, but what I like to do is sort of that systems approach where I look at all the resources in the district and it goes school to school because there are pockets of resources. There always are. Things shift, people move around, kids move around. So you're like, okay, yeah, I could do this, I could do this. So it's really trying to be sort of outside the box thinkers. We have a really strong team that um, tries to look at ways. So the other emphasis on that is the whole um, wanting to make sure everything was inclusive and equitable. And it just doesn't feel right to charge. So we don't, it doesn't matter your income, you, you know, A, you have you have to be a master resident for the four-year-old program. Um, it allows the choice from K on up. But it really for me is that early exposure for those children and leveling the playing field because it is it is hard. I mean, we have a lot of single parents. And so for me, it still is there's the fact that our our you know a work day ends at five and our preschool day ends at 2.50. There's glitchiness in that, and some for some reason we do have an after school program that the town coordinates with us that's in our buildings, but it's a different license to include that four year olds. So that's a whole other layer of um, headache that I think I would love to be able to try to solve that as well as our, um, our families. But most of the families, you know, they do drive their students um, to school, but I do realize that that can be a problem as well. But that transportation piece can be a little bit important. But uh, I, we really do see the growth in students in terms of their readiness at the kindergarten level, but I just want to say it's not all about the academics for me. It's really about supporting the families. It's about helping these young young children get that best foundation, best start that they can get. And we have experts in our schools, and we have a wealth of resources. You know, I, I feel we're very well resourced um, with expertise and also materials. So giving those those students that exposure they get to go to the art classes they get to have a few week class they get to learn how to interact with their peers which it, you know it's definitely been harder through covid and it's starting to be lingering i think for several years in terms of that aspect um not to get off on the soapbox but all teachers i think in all districts i'm trying to figure out how what is the magic potion i need to give them to make them <laughs> sort of come back to being who they are because they have become um, much broader sort of therapists. And I had a, just an example of a teacher in the upper grade, and I know we're all taught that she, the kids come to her because they connect to her. And she said to me, I just don't know if I have the capacity to sort of be the therapist. I'm like, the counselors need to build a relationship, but they come to you. And she goes, well, I got my own stuff and I'm teaching you know, science. And, but all the teachers are getting that. So the level of stress in the families, we see it in our kids. And so getting those youngest students in, into that sort of structure, routine, the safety net of school is really important. Like most kids at that age are not super happy about when vacation rolls around because that's disruption. Um, it's difficult. We work with paid kids meals with making sure, you know, all weekends that our needy families have the food. I love the free. Um, food that we've had for two years for yeah. lunches, yeah. that to my mind should continue and that would be a great thing uh, because that is a burden lifted off the families as well. But really for us, if I could, and I, I plead this all the time with our town, like what are we doing for, and I don't like the term low income housing, they're starter homes. Like people, people are good people just because they don't make a lot of money, but people have this sort of concept that's negative. And, um, you know, if these families just see support but that four-year-old program has really been sort of um, a rock star for us and then trying to expand really the, the integrated program as well um, but truly if you ever are feeling down and you're not around the school and you need to stop kind of saying right? <laughs> just going to spend some time with children because they they reinvigorate your hope for what's going on thank you very much yeah. It's interesting the three municipalities that we have here based on seniors, Gary Cake, smaller year round populations, different demographics. And so, whether the municipalities is involved, whether the school committee is involved, you know, having been the assistant town manager in Barnesville, there's always that struggle over the revenue sharing, right? How you're going to split between the school system and the municipalities. But it'd be nice if we get to a point with child care and early education that there was a blended and more supportive approach to. Financially, at least. So, 
Well, and to acknowledge that the town managers, they're supportive and, and I mean, paying for it, how will we pay for it? It's still the same fund. Yeah. 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 So Ultimately, it comes from the same fund. It's so this house is under the school budget right now. Right. Great. Yeah. So next up our, in our final presentation for this evening is uh, Christy Senatori, the executive director of the best regional planning agency in the country, <laughs> the Impact Commission. Oh, yeah. Not because we used to run it. But <laughs> <laughs> I do have a handful of slides that are going to be great. I'm working on it. Perfect. Awesome. So, and, and I'll be brief. I know there's uh, probably some interest in some questions. And I have to first just say how impressed I am with this panel of speakers. I just learned so much tonight. I think this is really, really, really great. And uh, I can't thank Paul and the Chamber enough for hosting this session. Mm -hmm. um, but it is such a critical and important topic to discuss and you know just to want to talk for a minute the housing crisis is is just exacerbating all these other issues and it's you know probably one of the biggest issues that we need that we need to tackle and uh with the, the child care crisis and challenges that we're facing in the region are equally and not just more important. So um, the commission is obviously the, the regional land use planning agency for the region, but we are as much a data and information agency at the same time. So while we may not work in childcare on a daily basis, we work in data and information. So that's where our role kind of working with the 15 communities um, really comes into play. So if you can kind of move on to the next slide here. You've seen some of these numbers, heard some of these numbers already, um, but we do have the second highest cost of childcare in the nation behind DC. Um, we heard that annual cost for infant care was about twenty thousand dollars a year. Um, and you know, some of us that that's almost an in-state school tuition. So there's certainly these costs are not in line with what we're seeing for wages in the region, obviously. So this isn't anything new. You've heard this repeatedly throughout the evening, so I'm not going to go into too much more data here. Um, but if we move on to the next slide, what I want to focus on is what the commission is currently doing to uh, address some of the child care needs in the region. So uh, we work very closely with Department um, Peak and Senator Moran to secure some funding and the budget to conduct a needs assessment related to early education and child care. There's a lot of information out there. There's been a lot of studies previously. Many of you in this room have done a lot of this um, analysis, but we really wanted to try to get um, at a more granular level, just looking at the case um, in terms of access and, and availability uh, to services in the region. So um, we took this opportunity to really identify where there's uh, a need to do additional analysis. And so um, we are currently working to develop two surveys that are actually out in the field right now. And we actually have a few handouts right here. So um, feel free to, to share this information. Um, we're working with the Rennie Center for Education Research and Policy out of Boston um, to have a, two different surveys that are out in the field currently. Um, we're working on one that's uh, for families and one that's for providers. We'll go into a little bit of detail there. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, I can just um, talk to you a little bit about what we're doing with the $200,000 that we received from the state. A lot of this is um, looking at what's out there currently for data and information and reviewing a lot of what you've already shared tonight, what's available uh, across the board. The survey and sampling that we're doing um, and the outreach and implementation that I would just highlight that Sarah Pullman, who's our communications manager sitting in the back, um, she's done a lot of uh, really great work um, putting together some um, information so that we can really reach a broad audience. And then we went to the next slide here, and I'm going through these quickly because there is another handout that does go into a little bit more detail on, on what we are doing here. We're going to follow up the surveys with a series of focus groups so that we can better understand the information that's in those surveys. And also, if there's um, some that may not have taken the survey for some reason, uh, some of those the in home providers that may not necessarily want to talk more directly with them. And then the more important parts of this are really the gap analysis and identification of strategies. And so the gaps, um, we're not exactly sure what we're going to find, but we wanted to take this opportunity to identify where the needs are um, and where there are those gaps. And uh, are those gaps, uh, you know, are we looking at um, gaps in service, gaps in uh, 
there's all of our skills and our providers, and are there other ways that we can help meet these types of um, needs? And then identification of strategies and a report that we'll, we'll put together, um, really trying to identify areas where there's opportunities to address some of these needs um, that can then line us up for additional funding that we kind of um, addressed. So the family survey, um, really for parents, guardians of children five and under, we're looking at parts of county, also looking at the islands. And it's asking questions like how much they come to pay, what type of daycare uh, or early child care would um, provider would, like, would they like to have their children um, be at? And then um, uh, how long is their commute? Is it, is it far for them to take the to go from their um, their their daycare facility to wherever they need to be going for their job. We've got this in a variety of different languages, and these surveys are open through May 4th. Um, so far to date, we have about 500 families that have filled out this uh, family survey. Now, the next one is our provider survey. Um, again, we're looking at child care centers and other opportunities and really addressing cost, capacity, location, and types of programming or services. And again, this one is also open to May 4th. We have um, about 40 providers so far that have responded to this. So we're looking to see those numbers increase. Um, and I know some of you have been doing some outreach for us. And, like and so, um, just kind of giving you a, an update on some of the information that we've put out there. You probably you may have heard some of our advertisements on the radio. We've been um, served together uh, a variety of different media strategies that can really reach out to as many people as possible. So. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. I know there's a lot of other questions, but um, we will have all this data and information publicly available when we complete the report uh, in a couple of months. We'll have it all up on our um, data site, which is datacapepod.org. Um, we'll also make sure that uh, publicly make this uh, report available so that we can take this information and use it in, in a meaningful way. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. So what we've heard today, we've heard uh, about the federal legislation, what's happening sort of federally and advocacy that we can do on the federal level. We've heard about businesses uh, advocating for additional state resources. We've heard from organizations that have organized regionally to support state changes. We've heard from three towns that are, are doing stuff. And we've heard uh, from the Cape Cod Commission, who's got a study engaged now that should provide more data to help us continue to advocate. Right? So to, and that was the, the hope of, of, uh, of these advocacy and action sessions is that that's what we do. Look at the whole picture, figure out what we can do locally that's most effective and most efficient uh, to, to move uh, solutions to the important challenges forward. So uh, I want to thank all of the panel members uh, right now. Uh, this is really big, right? It's it certainly past uh, our goal. So thanks for being here. But we are uh, right back on time. So we have, we have uh, time for questions. Does anyone have any questions for the panel? Yes, ma'am. Um, Jackie and Gail uh, specifically wanted to, and Gail, you kind of already hinted at this, but you're worried about are there enough providers to meet the demand? Um, if you could both just kind of talk about how close are you on that and, you know, demand exceeding providers. Yeah, right now, we have not heard, I have not heard of parents who can't find childcare in our region. However, we're lucky we have the children's place right in East End that provides a lot of services, right? So. Um, but we both programs are designed so that parents, if you work in Yarmouth and you live in East End, you can choose a child care provider in Yarmouth so that your child is close to you. <laughs> because as a mom, I understand that. You know, you don't want to be an hour and a half away from your, your kid. So both of them are designed that way. What we're hoping is that we're giving those providers some steady income oh, yes. so that you know they are a little more sustainable. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but that was my hope. So the one thing that has come to my attention is that um, children who do not, who are not three by that cutoff date and parents had planned on putting them into preschool, now they're finding that the preschools are filled up because this money is available, so more parents are signing up. Okay, so that's so that's I, had, I hadn't anticipated that, and this was through just a personal connection that that this.
came up and I thought, wow. You know, and we also have very few um infant programs in our area. Like I, you know, you really have to travel to to get an infant program. So that's I think it's one of the children's place, one in Brewster. I don't know if there's anything in one of these. And and I just want to say that um the town of Brewster was interested in, in you know what we were doing and the, the town of Chatham also. It's on the warrant for Chatham. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um and Truro has something on their warrant. And well. they're going into summer <laughs> summer worker child care. Mm -hmm. So they're really again as as Paul was saying, it's like it just right. it expands. It's like dominoes. Yeah, yeah. 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 So mm -hmm. well. Stacey Pugh, YMCA Cape Cod CEO, Denise Graham Reardon, my partner in crime and expanding childcare as much as we can. We're kind of in public hiding these days because <laughs> <laughs> we're like worried, you know, yeah. and we can't fill, we have empty classrooms right now because of the workforce crisis. Mm -hmm. So we want to help, we want to expand, we want to do more as yeah. these mm -hmm. things start to become more accessible for families. Will the classrooms be there? With the teachers to do it right now the answer is you know tough it's it's tough we're trying like crazy but yeah i'm always kind of like oh no somebody else called us and, and that's what i don't want to say now you know start increasing that baseline that's really yes. the it that's really the key. we need the legislation and we need that the base funding for child care centers i mean that would be awesome huge mm -hmm. yeah yes sir Hi, Beth Gaffney with CACCI Child Care, and we maintain our service areas uh, wait list for eligible assistance. And I just want to echo the concern for infant care. Yeah. We have seen a trend since the pandemic kicked in. It used to be that we didn't have enough money for and and have the ability to send out what we call funding available funding availability letters to families saying, "Hey, there's a voucher for you." Um, now we're seeing how we're sending the letters out, and these families don't have a place to take them yeah. and use them. So I would, I would wholeheartedly agree that um, you know more more funding into the field is hugely important, but but funding for the capacity building is critical. Mm -hmm. And so as we look at what where this money is going, as we look at what it's going to earmark for, I would really I'm would advocate for building workforce and building location because we have a lot of babies that were born as a result of the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and I and every day our free information referral service is getting called saying, where can I go with my baby? I want to go back to work, but I have no baby. Yeah. Thank you. Are there, are there any other questions? Yeah, yeah I'm Claire McManus with the South Shore Autism Center. And we have the early intervention contract um, for the Cape and the Islands. And we're, we have a couple of families that have asked for services. And we're trying to um, assess the need for opening up a center on the Cape. I realize that staffing it will also be a problem. But um, we really don't know. And we've tried to get that information but I, I don't know whether that's going to be part of the needs assessment, but are there a lot of families that have children that uh, need autism services? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 Great. Yes. Thank, yes. You. Thank you. Thank you for that. Erica. So um, as a former provider and now as a grandmother, <laughs> uh, I just want to make sure that we're keeping after school, out of school care kind of in front and center as well, because for families that are working, uh, school vacations and uh, summers you know, become a very high ticket uh, for them. So it, I love what the, the municipalities are doing. I, I, you know, it's just inspirational to hear what you're doing. And uh, um, and also the other piece would be to look at family child care. Um, it's a great option for infants and toddlers, mm -hmm. and I think some effort around building capacity around uh, family child care as well, um, I think would be an important uh, step. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. This is more of a general question and comment. So one of the things that I think, I think we continue to skirt around is the wage of the people working in family or child care centers. And Sandy's heard me say this before, and Tom said it tonight. Until the public schools take this on, both early education and high quality care, 
those folks, it's always going to be a problem mm -hmm. with getting folks because we're not valuing their work. And that's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. um, Amy, so could, I just, could I just respond to that though? Um, our goal is not to put child, um, child care, other child care um, organizations out of business. Right. All right. And we were very, very sensitive to that. And that's why we felt that it was important that the, the, the amount would be paid for a licensed preschool, no matter where it was. I understand the discrepancy and I don't disagree with you, but I think that we also don't want to put those child care businesses out of, out of business. Because they're the experts. The truth is, the public schools right now, we have to learn how to take care of the right. They don't do it. Well, so <laughs> that's yes, the opportunity Amy. to bring those people. I understand, but but the legislation will do will do that right. and support all those private businesses and those private providers. So I I think I understand your perspective, and I totally respect any school district who wants to take it on, and I certainly would be open to that for Nauset, But I think. That the legislation really, when I read that, it covers all the points that I think we really need mm -hmm. that building of capacity and that just base funding for all these people who are out there struggling now. Like, why, why pluck them out of what they have and hire new people and train them to work in schools? And, and that's not the intent of my comment, it's no. just how they and they 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 we're supporting you know, the town yeah. is doing the same the thing on the start shows that when a program like this is implemented it will incentivize new people to go into the early education care profession mm -hmm. but you must include the mandate that you have to have fair and living wages mm -hmm. that has to be up front so to be licensed in the town of the mass under EDC, you would have to pay your employees at the rates that are comparable with a preschool teacher in the public case mm -hmm. uh, which is in the 60,000 range. Yeah. I, I just want to, I want to jump in from Zoom land. Um, hey. It's so good to hear uh, familiar names in the audience. Um, I think it is what the Common Start legislation is about, but it's also, as we work with communities across the state, we always encourage folks, if you're going to do a landscape analysis, to really do it birth through five, because we see the tensions that it creates when we focus on one part of the sector. So we, we as we work with communities, that's to all, answer all the questions that each of the panelists talked about. How many children are there? What is the parent demand? What does it look like? And how can we best serve all the children in this community? We have watched communities that didn't necessarily get the parent feedback first. And they had open classrooms in public schools because once the parents figured out it was a school day and there wasn't a good collaboration with the school age programs, you know, that it fell on the parents to try to figure it out. So that would be my, it's, it is really inspiring to hear how each of the municipalities has taken on this challenge. But I think part of the common start legislation is thinking about birth all the way through school age. And mm -hmm. if we could think about that when we're, when, when we're working in communities, not that one part of the sector can't do it all. So how are we really thinking about working together? And I would also echo, you know, the funding, the, st the stable, consistent, significant funding that's going to be needed. You know, we see many early educators, um, th they're living in like with a scarcity mentality. And that's because we keep telling them to do more with less. And we all have to kind of be advocates around changing that mental model. And, and we've seen examples of when folks are able to have full funding that's consistent and they don't have to worry about that. They can kind of concentrate on the care and the education that is so essential for all the children. Um, but it has been so exciting to hear all these developments. Um, and I really applaud the leadership at the local level who are really looking at solutions and coming up with them and making it happen. So thank you for all of those presentations. Thank you, Amy. And, and uh, just uh, Christy pointed out the sort of lack of men that are in the room. So, uh, <laughs> They're home taking care of the kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, the, uh, but, but it is. You know, child care, child care industry, child care employment has always in order to fell on uh, women 
And it's hard to believe that the wage gap is the same on the way. So I uh, want to keep that uh, in mind also. Are there any other additional questions, Stephen? Stephen, I want to thank you all, but I also want to thank uh, my staff. Uh, the newest addition, uh, Katie Axon, right here. Thank you. Awesome. Noel Kina, who you probably most have heard from on this, uh, just a really important issue. She's worked really hard on this. She had her final citizenship interview today. And she did. She's the approved. Only that she's not here, so but I did want to recognize the work that she did in putting this together. And, and she did her. pass her civics exam. So oh, she, yeah. she did pass it. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how much, how many of us have yeah. 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 She wrote that email. So, so thank you all. And then just in closing, know that if uh, you're advocating on whatever level, federal, federal level, the state level, especially on the local level, with some of these prime examples here, and you need support from the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce as you move forward with that, Thank you. Thank you.